Good morning, everybody. Um, I hope you can hear me up the back. I don't have a particularly loud voice, so if I start mumbling partway through the presentation, just sort of yell at me and I'll try and speak up. Uh, so, as Melissa said, I work here at UNSW, um, and my field of research is ocean variability, more on the natural variability side rather than the climate change side, but of course you can't really do one without the other. Um, and mostly I look at low frequency variability, so that means decadal to multi-decadal, sort of 10 to 100 year time scale variability um, in the ocean. Um, it's a little different to what the first lecture this morning is about, um, which is just general ocean circulation. The second lecture is a little bit more related to my actual field of um, research. That's the ocean um, variability topic. Um, so feel free to interrupt with questions in between because uh, it's quite a varied audience, like a, you have a quite varied background. So if I start just talking about ocean jargon that you don't know what it is, please interrupt me um, so that I can explain it properly. Uh, or if you just have any questions. Okay, so... Brief outline of what I'm going to be talking about. So, in general, the circulation of the ocean. We tend to divide... Um, ocean circulation into two parts when we're explaining it, the wind-driven part, which is the upper couple of hundred meters of the ocean, and then the thermohaline part, which is, well, the deeper stuff. Um, so I'll explain those a bit. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about the Southern Ocean, because it's pretty important uh, when you're considering ocean circulation, and also, also it's the closest one to us, so we look at it a lot. Um, then I'll talk a bit about traces, what they are and how we use them to learn about the ocean circulation. And then I'll go more into the topic of this winter school, which is supposed to be the climate change part of it. So I'll talk about anthropogenic effects um, on ocean circulation, um, what they look like at the moment, and as they go into the future, um, how we think they might change the ocean circulation further. Okay, so to start with, what drives ocean circulation? This picture you've probably seen some form or other already. Uh, so it's incoming solar radiation that is absorbed um, at the surface of the Earth. So, oops. Sorry. Uh, as we would expect, there's more solar radiation at the low latitudes and less as you go to high latitudes. Um, it's not exactly... Uh, symmetric, so you, you have portions you know, where you have less than at the same latitude, and that is uh, so mostly because of the albedo, so clouds and snow or something like that, land stuff, you know, not my area of expertise. Um, but in general, the main pattern is you know, higher radiation at the equator and lower at the poles. Then if you look at the outgoing solar radiation, Similar sort of pattern, more at the equator, less at the poles. But this is the same scale as the previous plot. And you can see that you have a lot less coming out at the equator than is going in, and a lot more coming out from the poles than is going in. So if you look at that you know, zonal average, uh, here's the absorbed, and there's the outgoing. So you have this deficit. So we must be having heat transported from the lower latitudes to the higher latitudes. Because to first order, the outgoing long wave radiation is determined by temperature, which means <coughs> this is, at the equator, it's colder than you'd expect, and at the poles, it's warmer than you'd expect, just um, if you looked at the absorbed solar radiation. So in terms of the ocean, what this looks like, so this is a plot of sea surface temperature, the annual mean. Um, and you can see, of course, again, it's warmer at the equator, colder at the poles, and also not uh, like a pure function of latitude. So we have warmer water here on the western side of the basin than on the eastern side, um, and that's sort of the same picture in, in all the basins, roughly. Um, and so why is that, and how is that related to um, the ocean circulation? So... If we have heat coming in here and heat going out here, somehow we're going to have heat transported from the low latitudes to the high latitudes. And if we're considering the surface of the ocean, that's done by what we call the wind-driven 
circulation. Because, uh, well, as you will have heard in your atmosphere lectures, which I think were earlier in the week, we have winds, and they push the water around, and then combine the effect of the winds with uh, the rotation of the Earth, you get um, the Coriolis effect on the moving water, and you, you get um, ocean currents. So I'm not going to go through detailed um, mathematical explanations because, you know, it's day four and I think you had a party yesterday, so I thought um, maybe that would just put you all further to sleep. But it's all, if you're interested in mathematical theories, this is a rather beautiful one. You can work out exactly why we get the circulation that we see. Um, so what that circulation looks like, if you're not familiar, is these western boundary currents, which carry water, warm water northwards, and then a slow return flow southwards over the rest of the basin. And so that's the same, approximately the same in all the basins. Here we have the Gulf Stream, which is probably the most famous western boundary current. Here we have the Kuroshio. Here we have the East Australia Current, uh, the Agulhas Current, and so on. Um, and so what's interesting about that is, again, it's not symmetric. That you have a quite narrow westerly flow, um, west, narrow flow on the west side going northwards and a very broad one on the, on the east side. Um, and this is something that people have known about and been interested in for a very long time. So this is a map from well, 1856 where they've drawn uh, roughly the currents. And this was of particular interest to them because for shipping, for example, um, if you're going from Europe to America, you don't want to get stuck in the current which is going the opposite direction. Whereas if you're going from America to Europe, that would be a good thing. You know, you're getting some extra help along the way from, uh, from the Gulf Stream. So the Gulf Stream in particular has been quite well studied because there was a lot of shipping um, across this ocean. You'll notice down here there's a great big not much of anything drawn. <laughs> uh, this is still a problem. If you look at data sets now, you get a great big white spot in the Southern Ocean because, well, it's really windy, it's really cold, there's lots of ice. Um, basically, the advice to, ship to, to sailors was, you know, don't go there unless you want whales or something. Otherwise, just don't go there because there's no gold, there's no spices, it's, you'll probably freeze and then get sunk in a storm, you know, just there be dragons, basically. <laughs> you also notice the, the riverless district. That's one of my favourites. We have one down here, too, in Australia, which is a bit cut off. The riverless district. <laughs> Don't go there, either. You'll you know, die of thirst. But anyway, sorry, I'm getting a bit sidetracked. Uh, we're looking at ocean currents. Um, yes, yeah, so this is something that's pretty well reasonably well observed, quite well studied, nice mathematical theory for it, and nice modeling of it as well. So this is from an ocean model, and what they've plotted is the mean barotropic stream function. So that's the um, depth averaged transport in sphere drops, which is a unit of volume transport we use a lot in oceanography. It's a million cubic meters per second. Uh, so you can see the gyres nicely. So this is the subtropical gyre in each ocean. This is the subpolar gyre, which goes the opposite direction. Subtropical gyre again. And then in the southern ocean, we don't have the um, nice continental boundaries which block the flow, which is what causes these gyres to appear. So we basically just get a current that goes around and around and around. That's the Antarctic circumpolar current. And you can see it's the strongest one more than 100 spur drips. So for, for context, um, if you add up all the river discharge into the world oceans, I think it's 1.2 spur drips or something. So that's basically 100 times the volume of all the rivers at once going around there. Um, so that's an extremely brief overview of the wind-driven circulation. Now if we move on to the other half, which is called the thermohaline circulation. So th um, thermo for temperature, haline for salt, so it's basically not the bit that's driven by the wind, it's driven by density, by salt and temperature changes. 
So now, instead of looking at the ocean from the surface, if we look at it from the side, so this little schematic, this is the surface of the ocean, this will be one pole, that'll be the other pole, um, this axis will be depth. So you have heat gain at the equator, so you'll end up with a blob of warm water um, just from the solar radiation. You'll have heat loss out of the poles, because it's cold, um, and somehow this heat is going to be transported. And we've seen that, that a lot of that heat goes in the western boundary currents. Um, but if we're looking sort of deeper than that, then, so this is how the heat comes in. And then if you just rearrange it by gravity, because the, the warm water is uh, less dense, so if you just let gravity do its thing, it should just stratify itself with the, the denser water at the bottom, so the colder water and the warmer water at the top. And so the combination of your heat input, your rearranging by gravity, um, what we actually end up with is a picture that looks like this. So this is a slice through the Atlantic Ocean. This is actual observations now. Um, people go out on ships and sail up and down that line and take measurements. They're much more patient than me. Um, and this is a plot of temperature. So you can see at the top, it's warm. We have these sort of blobs of water that, that correspond to the um, subtropical, subtropical gyres. And then at the bottom, it's cold. So if we look a bit at the history of this, 1798, oh wait, sorry, 1751, somebody went out to 25 degrees north, 25 degrees west, stuck a really long thermometer on the end of a chain, measured deep, some deep water. It was the, pretty much the first time it had been done. Um, and the water they pulled up from down there was cold. So they thought, well, of course it's cold. I mean, it's far away from the sun. It's, you know, the, the solar radiation is only going to make a couple of hundred meters into the surface. Down there, it's dark, it's cold, of course. Obvious. They didn't think that that implied anything about the circulation. But then, a few years later, 1798, Benjamin Thompson <coughs> took that one measurement and guessed, well, suggested that it meant the water wasn't cold because it was far away from the sun, the water was cold because it came from the poles, which is pretty smart. I mean, why would you even think that? <laughs> so his idea was that the ocean water is acu actually circulating. So the water that they measured here actually came from the surface in the north. That's why it was cold, or the south. And he was right. And it took, well, 1988 was the, the first time somebody managed to get a computer model to do it. So the original suggestion from Benjamin Thompson was that you have the warm water, like the water is warmed at the equator, it moves northwards, and then it gets cold and it sinks in both hemispheres because we have cold north and south. And then somehow, slowly in the middle, it upwells. So you have this sort of overturning, deep overturning circulation, which is driven by temperature and by salt as well. That's why we call it thermohaline. So this is just the temperature picture. If you look at salt, it looks a little bit more complicated. So this is the same section through the Atlantic. And now you see you have this sort of tongue of fresh water here, this tongue of salty water here and this one here of reasonably like medium fresh water. And it, so it doesn't look quite as simple as your symmetric overturning anymore. So now that we have more data and more models, we can sort of get a more nuanced picture of what's actually happening. And so this is the North, North Atlantic. You get cold water sinking there. This is near Antarctica, you get cold water sinking there, but it's two different types and two different densities. So the main sort of sinking that fills the vast, the majority of volume of the ocean, or at least the Atlantic Ocean, is what we call North Atlantic deep water. But then the other two, Antarctic waters, you have the one that's really deep. So you'll remember from the previous slide, it's really cold. So it's about zero degrees, this water here. But it's not that, it's not that salty. 
So that's Antarctic bottom water. And then the one that's a bit higher, you, you only really see it in the salinity. You don't see it that clearly in temperature. I mean, you wouldn't think that there was anything particular going on here. Um, and it's the reason that sort of stands out here is it's quite uh, fresh comparatively to the rest of the water. But it's still cold, so this one's warmer and saltier, and this one's colder and fresher, so it's denser, and it goes um, underneath the surface waters, but it's lighter than this one, so you get this sort of interleaving of the different water masses. I don't know if I'm explaining that very clearly, but um, basically what I'm trying to say is you get different water masses formed in different regions through different processes. So these two were formed in approximately the same region, but through different processes. This one's formed in the North Atlantic, and we name them by their origin. So this is North Atlantic deep water, this is Antarctic bottom water, and Antarctic intermediate water. And they all flow into the ocean, and the level they end up at depends on their density. Um, and, yeah, then they all circulate. So if you want to look at a more cartoon picture, this is the... Um, sort of the introductory slide of thermohaline circulation that people usually show. Um, and it's, well, I mean, it's very simplified, so obviously it's a bit wrong, but it's a bit useful as well to explain what's going on. So you have these sinking regions. So the blue arrows show the deep circulation, and the red-orange arrows show the sort of more surface um, circulation. So here we have sinking, where heat is released to the atmosphere. You deform the deep waters in the near Antarctica and up in the North Atlantic as well. And that water flows down, fills up the rest of the ocean, and then somewhere it slowly rises back up to the surface, and you end up with surface water, which flows back again and ends up uh, in the North Atlantic or the Southern Ocean again and sinks. So I've got a little movie of this, if I can make it work. There we go. So this is a, um, from a numerical model, it's, it's a particle tracking. So the particle started off in the North Atlantic, uh, and the colour shows its depth. So it started at the surface, and then it sank um, here in the Labrador Sea, and then it's going off on its little path. You can see the year, so this is five, nearly 600 years already it's been going. And it's not a nice, smooth, you know, we end up in the North Atlantic, and then we go around, and then we end up back there again. It sort of goes everywhere. We can just be mesmerized by it for a while. <laughs> And if you watch the colour, you see it also changes. See there, it went blue for a bit, so it got quite deep. And then it, oh, there, it got deep again. And, well, it's kind of interesting to watch, because you can see it gets stuck. Like, there it's, you know, probably in an eddy going, and then it be out of the eddy and go somewhere else, and then it'll zoom around the Southern Ocean a few times. <laughs> there we go, went a little bit deeper again. Um, so this is just one particle. Obviously, every particle is going to have a slightly different path. Um, and waiting for it to get to the end of it. So the criteria for these particles, they had to start in the North Atlantic and they had to finish there as well. And what this study did was um, basically work, try to calculate how long that took them. So, you know, some particles did a really quick loop, you know, just once, and some of them took... This one takes two and a half thousand years. <laughs> It'll get there eventually. <laughs> Did anyone used to play that game on the old style mobile phones? You know the snake where you had to. Yeah. Yeah. Come on, come on, you can do it. You can do it. <laughs> no, it's stuck in the subtropical yeah. gyre. <laughs> oh, subpolar gyre, excellent. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Go particle. Okay. So, so this 
So that particle took about 3,000 something years. It's about here in the distribution. So this is the age at completion. So um, the time it takes them to basically do one loop from the North Atlantic round again and back into the North Atlantic. Um, and yeah, so the probability. So this, I don't know what the shortest one was, like a couple of hundred years. Hmm, pretty short actually, like 100 years or something, but not very many of them manage that. The vast majority of them take thousands of years to do that kind of loop. Um, so yeah, that's pretty cool. And three and a half thousand years is sort of the, the median age, which is, makes you realize that the world is big and the water is slow and, you know, it takes its time. Okay, so to look a bit more closely at overturning. Um, this top plot is the sort of one we usually look at. Um, we have depth and latitude. So this is from a model. So you have the North Atlantic cell here. You have the Antarctic water coming here, like the bottom water overturning cell. Um, yeah, so I'm not going to explain this too much because actually the reason we don't like using this type, I mean, it's easy to think about because it's actual physical space, but it's actually, if you start looking at the details, it's actually kind of not that useful because of the Southern Ocean. So this is a, um, you average over all the latitudes, um, over all the longitudes, sorry, um, to get this sort of zonal slice. And because of the way the Southern Ocean, it's got that, an opening and the, the current goes right around the world, but not always at the same latitude. So you end up with some of your overturning cells sort of cancelling each other out. Or So basically a lot of this overturning here, you think, oh, that looks really interesting. There's something going up and going down, but it's, it's spurious because of the way um, <coughs> the geography works. So if you want to look at it a little bit more um, realis usefully, um, people have come up with a whole bunch of different sort of coordinate systems for how to look at this. Um, so I just thought I'd explain a couple of those briefly. So this one, the next closest to reality, looks at it in latitude and density space. So if you follow one of these circles around, what you have seeing is here the water is getting... Uh, okay, so density is the other way around. So it's getting denser as it goes to higher latitude and then goes back to lower latitude at approximately the same density and then slowly goes, well, actually, you can't tell if it's slow. Um, it goes back to lower density again at approximately, like, without changing its latitude that much. So then if you think about that, that is this cell because it's, well, it's going northwards for a start. It's getting more dense. So that's this water here at the surface getting colder as it goes northwards, losing heat. And then going southwards, approximately the same density, and then upwelling. That's why it's slow. Um, and it's same, similar in the southern hemisphere, except here you also have this part here, which is very dense water, which goes much further north. So this is the, um, this cell, uh, if that makes sense. Another way of looking at that, which is not, um, well, I mean, now there's no geographical references in here. So you have salinity on this coordinate and temperature on this coordinate. And this is where you see that the, you can't, in this sort of context, you can't <coughs> neatly divide up the oceans into, well, you can't divide them up. So you can't say this is the Pacific Ocean and this is what its circulation is doing. This is the Southern Ocean and this is what its circulation is doing because, I mean, where, where is that? It's like, this is the global ocean picture. Um, so you have water that is getting warmer and then getting saltier and then getting colder and then getting fresher as it goes around like that. So that is basically what the global overturning circulation is doing. But as I said, it's very far removed from geography. So if you want to put the geography back into it, what they do is color code each. So you have your model. You color code each grid point, each 
point in the ocean by its position, according to this map, and then you plot it. So then you can see, oh, okay, so the really salty water, that's from the Mediterranean. The really fresh water, that's from the Arctic. The really warm water, that's from the equatorial Indo-Pacific. And then combining the different maps, you can start to get a good idea of what the act actual circulation is looking like, so how the water mass transformations take place. Okay, any questions on that? Okay. All totally clear or to totally confused? So now I'm going to talk a bit about the Southern Ocean. Okay. So, uh, so uh, the, the, when you're talking about the different ways to represent the overturning circulation, so if you were reading a paper that was presenting changes in overturning circulation, you'd like to see that just that classic depth um, plot, but then supplemented with a potential density one in density space, sorry? It depends. It depends what you're looking at. If you're looking at overturning changes in like one particular basin, so there's lots looking at, and we'll look at some later, um, the North Atlantic, mm -hmm. for example, then it makes sense to just have it <coughs> like the geographical. Just the dead space. Yeah, so the first one there. Um, because it's just a single basin. Sort of the confusion comes if you're looking at particularly the Southern Ocean, or if you're looking at the global picture, because then you're averaging over different basins where quite different things are happening. Um, so we're going to talk... Oh, actually, we're going to talk about it now. Um, so if you go back to this picture, you can see that... Oops. In the North Atlantic, you have uh, warm water going northwards at the surface, sinking and going southwards at depth at much colder temperature. And in fact, if you look over the whole basin, you have a northward transport of warm water. Um, whereas in the Pacific, it kind of goes the opposite way on average. So if you're averaging over the whole globe, you're going to be missing a lot because you're averaging to quite opposite things that are very geographically different in space. And so that's why people, if they're studying the global circulation, tend to go to these other weird coordinate systems. Um, so yeah, context. If you're looking at a single basin, um, geographical plot, well, personally, I like those because they make more immediate sense to me. Um, but if you're looking at a more global picture or if you're looking at Southern Ocean stuff where it's quite geographically different, um, then these kind of coordinate systems are more useful. Okay. So it's Southern Ocean. Um, this is a plot of surface velocity from the Southern Ocean State Estimate, which is a reanalysis product. And I just put it up there to sort of point out that the Southern Ocean is quite complicated. Um, so you have this current, which can go all the way around the world, so that's quite unique. Um, it's quite fast, it's a, like a it's large transport. The winds are um, also uninterrupted by mountains and so they're also quite uh, strong. And the result is that you have this current. We call it a, you know, a single current, it is the Antarctic Circumpolar Current. But if you start looking at the details, it's not actually one single current which nicely, neatly flows all the way around. It's all these little filaments of currents. And this poses a problem because it means, well, it means it's difficult to observe because things are quite small scale. It means it's difficult to model. You need quite high resolution models and we don't have a lot of observations to base those models on because of the other problem, which is the sea ice. So it's remote, it's cold, it's windy, it's covered in ice half the year. You know, it's, a, yeah, it's an observationalist's challenge, I guess. Um, and it's complicated. Uh, so it's, sorry, it hasn't got a scale. It's just showing velocity, surface velocity of the ocean. So all these red patches are um, <coughs> showing filaments of the current. Okay. 
Okay, so I'm not going to go into any of these in great detail because, well, we don't have time. It's not my area of expertise. Um, but just as an overview, so that you can sort of get an idea of the different processes that are there, and if you're interested in any of them, you can ask me or look them up or whatever. Um, so we have the westerly winds blowing very strongly across the ocean, and a little bit south of that we have easterlies, which are much weaker, so mostly we focus on the westerlies, and they drive the Antarctic circumpolar current. Uh, now, that also means, because of the Coriolis effect, that there will be uh, northward transport in the Ekman layer, so that means you're going to have a divergence northward transport here and a little bit of southward transport because of the easterlies, you're going to have upwelling. So that pulls some of the deeper waters towards the surface. And then because it's cold and windy, there's going to be large fluxes um, of heat. Um, so that is what drives the different water mass transformations. So you're pulling the, the deep water to the surface, and then you're changing its uh, heat content and its freshwater content to produce different water masses. So where the... the so that's where the heat part comes in. Where the salt part comes in is that we also have sea ice formation. So you have cold winds coming off the Antarctic continent. They, particularly in winter, they hit the sea. Um, sea ice, the surface gets so cold that it freezes. Um, and what happens during the formation of sea ice is that sea ice is um, sort of preferentially fresh. So it, it, as it's forming, it expels the salty, as much salt as possible. So you end up with sea ice, which is much fresher than the water it was formed from, and this um, is called brine rejection, uh, which is, brine is really salty water, so it, it's sort of expelled from the ice, and it's because it's so salty, it sinks, and as it sinks, it mixes um, with the water around it, so you end up with very cold, um, quite salty water, and that's what forms uh, the Antarctic bottom water. Um, and the other thing, that happens is that there's very rough topography. So if we go back to this plot here, um, you'll th you've at first thought you might think the current's just sort of whirling around, but actually it has it's like an obstacle course because well, it has to get through Drake Passage here, which is the narrowest spot, but then there's a couple of other places where there's really rough topography. So here, south of New Zealand, for example, there's the Campbell, Campbell Plateau, which is um, quite shallow. And there's basically one deep crevasse here where the current can get through. So you can see it does a bit of a sort of dip southwards so that it can get through that topography. And there's a few other places where similar things happen over here, um, over the mid-ocean ridges, over the Kerguelen Plateau, things like that. So it's quite um, top topographically steered. And because the topography is rough, you also get a lot of mixing. Um, so, I said all the things that need saying. Strong winds, yes, steep topography, ice formation and melting. Uh, so it's very high kinetic energy because of the winds. Um, so you have a lot of uh, transport and a lot of mixing due to that. Um, and we have intermediate and bottle water formation. So I was supposed to have a little video of the... Um, Southern Ocean, but unfortunately it's a very old video and it, it's in a format that this computer doesn't want to play. But the um, point of it was that you need a high resolution model to capture all these processes. So this is a one degree uh, ocean model, which is sort of of the order of a lot of the IPCC models, so it's not that bad. This is one sixth of a degree, and you can see the difference. So the, the plot now is showing the magnitude of the velocity average over the top 100 metres. And here it looks like quite a broad, smooth current, whereas here you can see all the little filaments or little eddies. Um, and if you are modelling your current with this kind of model, you're obviously missing a lot of processes. Because this region is so um, energetic and so eddy-rich, a lot of the transport is done actually by eddies um, across the current. So you're not going to have proper heat transport 
So it is actually going to affect your climate quite a lot because if you're not getting the proper heat transport, you're not having the proper bottom water formation. Um, uh, that was easy. Sorry, who said that? <laughs> <laughs> that was a bit creepy. Okay. Um, so, yeah, sorry, you're not having the proper bottom water formation, which means you're not having the proper ocean um, structure in density, which is eventually going to mean you're not having a proper climate at all. So this is something that has been quite a problem in ocean models and still, still is. Um, so this is a one-sixth model, which is quite high resolution if you're running a climate model, but people do studies with much, much higher resolution models in the ocean in the Southern Ocean as well. So there was one recently that was one sixtieth of a degree, um, which is a lot. Um, and they just ran it over one particular section because they couldn't run it over the whole ocean model because it was the whole um, globe because it's too expensive. But they found really interesting things that are happening on even smaller scales that we've never even sort of considered because we just haven't got models that can go that fine. Uh, so, Leila, sorry. Yeah. so for the, for the one six <coughs> model, mm -hmm. was that enough to have just kind of accurate formation rates around the bottom water around Antarctica? Was, did it have the continental shelves and then... Uh, so, it, oh, I don't actually know the different, the details, but um, bottom water formation around Antarctica is a real problem in models because you need, uh, so you need high resolution because you have to get all the shelf because, okay, so what I probably should have explained. If I, okay, so the the water formation doesn't happen sort of equally all around Antarctica. It usually happens in sort of little pockets. Um, so you need to get the topography right so that you get the mixing as the water goes down the topography right. You need to have get the sea ice right. A lot of these models, if you have just an ocean model, it doesn't do sea ice particularly well. Um, and on top of that, we don't actually have great observations of that because it is such a, well, as I said, remote, difficult place to observe. And because things are happening on quite small scale, you'd need to know exactly where to put your instruments to get proper observations. So, so we don't yeah. Know. yeah, we don't know. Yeah, I mean, it's it's... It sounds mean to say it, but it's, it's all quite speculative. You know, we're, we're sort of half guessing at what's going on in observations and then trying to model it. And um, that's why it's kind of an interesting area to work, right? Because it's yeah. just so much that's unknown about it. Um, so my next slide is a bit about that. It's, a, it's another movie. So this is from a reasonably high resolution model. It was run at NCI, and this um, movie was made by the NCI people as well. Uh, and the aim, the point of this model was to look um, at Antarctic bottom water formation. So um, up in, so it's one year that's repeating. So you, you can see that the season. And it's showing, so the colors show the speed. And now we're not looking at the surface anymore. We're looking at a deeper layer, so an isopycnal surface. So that's a surface of equal density. That's why it's not flat, because it's not a depth surface, density surface. And you can see the really rough topography and how the water has to sort of go through channels in the topography to, to get out of the Southern Ocean, basically. Um, we can just watch that. So those fast things that you see sort of running over the top, those are um, like synoptic weather patterns. Um, and here you can see sort of the dense water formation. So that this is in the Ross Sea, and this water is forming on the shelf and then sort of running over the shelf. So this is a quite uh, small scale process because it's running down the little canyons and 
it's not continuous. You'll have sort of, you know, it's, it'll be quite seasonal, vary a lot from year to year, just depending on what the conditions are like with, with the ice, things like that. So it's kind of a cool movie. And here, this is the Kerguelen Plateau, I think. And you can see the um, really high energy stuff that's happening in the, the lee of the plateau. So from the surface, there's one tiny little island that actually sticks above the surface. But below that, because there's a whole region that's quite um, topographically complicated, you get this large... Um, interesting circulation patterns over the topography. So okay, next. Okay, so now um, we're moving on from the Southern Ocean, unless anyone else has any questions? What's the, what's the typical vertical velocity for different formation? Oh, that's a hard question. I actually have no idea. Um, oh, sorry, no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Any Southern Ocean people here know that question? Really small. Really small? It's so small, like it doesn't even really show up in the model. Though, yeah. Because it's so regional, it'll just get averaged out. Make it extra hard, right? Okay, so uh, next I'm going to talk about tracers um, and what we can learn from them. So what I mean by tracer is um, something that some chemical or even not. So something that's in the water mass that helps you identify the water mass. So heat is a tracer. Salt is a tracer. Um, in this particular case, um, carbon-14 um, and I'll show you some other examples later. Um, some of them are more useful than others. So heat is not conserved, so it, it can sort of easily get out of the water mass. It's changed when you get to the surface, all those sorts of things. So it's a not a conserved tracer. Some of the other tracers are conserved, like uh, this one. That makes them useful for um, studying different problems. In this particular case, carbon-14, um, so when water is in the surface... So um, then, um, so it, it works basically like a regular carbon dating system. So when it's in the, in the surface ocean, it's exposed to cosmic radiation, you get carbon-14 production. Um, and then when it's away from the surface, you have no carbon-14 production anymore. So by comparing the ratio of carbon-14 to regular carbon, you can work out how long ago um, that water was at the surface, if that makes sense. Um, so basically, you're, it's telling you the age of your water. So it's a similar idea to the little movie I showed you before with the little squiggle that was going everywhere. Um, but this is in observations. Um, so what they did, they took all the measurements of carbon-14 and they made a plot of the age. And so what it shows, so blue is quite young, up to several thousand years old for the, the red. And you can see that, so the young stuff is around the Southern Ocean and coming from the North Atlantic. So that fits with our idea of where, um, the over where the sinking happens. So the sinking, you take water that was at the surface, you put it at depth. Oh, so this is below um, 1,500 metres, so it's deeper stuff. So this water was recently at the surface, and this water was recently at the surface. The stuff in the North Pacific hasn't been at the surface for 1,000 years at least. So that backs up our picture of the overturning because you have the sinking happening here and here. Um, so yeah, that's what I just said. Sinking happening there and there. And so the oldest water is going to sort of be here because it's done its whole loop and it's just on its way back. Uh, we also have anthropogenic traces. Um, this is particularly CFCs, CFC12. Um, and we know what 
the input of those was because we were emitting them for a couple of decades. Um, so you can track water that's been at the surface in, in the time since we started emitting CFCs. So this is a slice, um, again, the same slice I think I showed you before, through the Atlantic Ocean, this time plotting CFC concentration. So you can see it's quite high at the surface, and then you can see this tongue of water here from the North Atlantic um, coming in. So this was in 2003, this is 2013. So if you take the difference between those two, um, you can see where, um, like sort of how the water mass has been moving. So you can see this tongue here as the, the CFCs have got deeper. Uh, this area here, so in, this, in the south, I did leave. So you can see the part Antarctic intermediate water that's coming in. This whole layer here is where the CFCs are sort of getting mixed uh, downwards from the surface. And here, sort of, if you look closely at the numbers, you can see there is a little region here um, where the concentration has increased as well. Um, and that's this um, Antarctic bottom water coming in. Uh, so another example of this, this is my favourite, is in the Arctic. Because there were a couple of nuclear power stations and they weren't as careful with their um, radioactive waste as they quite should have been. So in the 90s they had a bit of an extra release of um, radioactive iodine um, into the North Sea. And so what people have done, they've traced the radioactive isotopes as they go into the Arctic Ocean. Um, the Arctic Ocean is kind of interesting because it's almost the complete opposite of the Antarctic. Right? We've got sea instead of a continent. It's, it's really closed off. You've only got a narrow entrance here and a very narrow entrance from the Pacific. Um, it's also got a lot of topography like the Antarctic. You have these ridges across here which are, um, they come up to quite shallow depths, so these different basins are quite separated from each other, and they have sort of tend to have their own independent um, circulations. And depending on uh, what the wind is doing, so you have Antarct uh, Atlantic water coming in from here, and you have Pacific water coming in from there, and depending on um, what the prevailing wind conditions are like, you can have one source of water dominating over the other. So in some years, um, if the winds are favourable, you'll have more Antarctic water taking, uh, Antarctic, Atlantic water overtaking the basin. And if in other years, for example, this is the Beaufort Sea and there's a uh, Beaufort High pressure system which sits over here. So if the Beaufort High um, is particularly strong, you'll get Pacific water coming in um, instead. So they've studied this using um, the anthropogenic traces. So what they do, they went out and, and measured radioactive isotopes at all these different points, um, and then they did it, they looked at it in, in their model, um, putting the observed winds on their model. And so this is just for one year, 1995, but they did it for a whole bunch of years, and so you can see uh, the Atlantic water encroaching more or less um, into the Arctic. Uh, okay, right, now I come on to the anthropogenic part of the talk. So heat, as I said, is another tracer. Um, you might have seen a plot like this previously this week, um, and it's looking at where the heat is going in the system. So uh, a little bit goes into ice sheets, a little bit goes into the atmosphere and onto the continents, but more than 90% of it is going into the ocean. Uh, and this, I think you probably would have seen yesterday. Uh, this is, um, again, where exactly the heat is going. A lot of it's still going into the upper ocean, because as we've seen, the deep ocean, um, it takes a lo long time for traces to get down there. So if we're thinking of heat as a tracer, it's still going to take a long time before um, the deep ocean starts to really catch up with all the extra heat. A lot of them are still kind of to be exactly worked out, because as we say, not all the models agree on all of these things. Um, things that we do think are quite robust is the, the slowing down of the North Atlantic sinking, for example. Uh, there's going to be ice melt, sea level rise. Um, ocean acidification's already been observed and will only get worse. 
and possible changes in cyclones. That's right, ask as many as you like. So, uh, how, how much, so, uh, when, when there's prime rejection, mm -hmm. how much salinity do we still have in these CIs? 3%. 3%. Compared to the rest of the So, of the sea water which it forms from, yeah. it'll keep about 30% of the salt and then 70% of the salt Stay. is rejected. That's quite a bit. Thank you, Caitlin. <laughs> yes, direct all the ice. <laughs> <laughs>